Welcome back to the Expanded Minds podcast. Today, I have a special guest with me, and his name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel is a singer, voice teacher, writer, coach, and healer. Nathaniel specializes in spiritual transformation, especially for men who are interested in S3 actual continents, semen retention, and spiritual growth, including those with S3 actual addiction, childhood trauma, or anything else that appears to stand in the way of complete freedom in love, health, happiness, and full self-expression. He also trains singers in every style of music and combine, combines voice lessons with the work of holistic healing and transformation. So with that being said, welcome on. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me, Ezekiel. Yeah, it's an honor. So where I want to start out with is, um, I think when you're around 19, you had went to Barnes and Noble and or around the age of 19 and you went to Barnes and Noble and there was a book that you saw that stood out to you. And the book was basically about like a man who went to India and he was looking for like a tantric guru or some kind of guru. And this guru mm -hmm. initiated him and this guru, yes. was it a girl? I think it was a girl or a guy. I can't tell. You I can't remember which one it was. It was a woman. Yes, it was a woman. It was a woman. Yes. Okay. So she Correct. initiated him and taught him how to retain his seed and have, orgasms without ejaculating and, and transform his body and his consciousness. So can you tell me like, what about that whole scene in your life changed it? Like what about that moment in your life changed sure. everything? That was, yeah, good question. Okay. So that was indeed, that was a turning point for me because I knew by virtue of the fact that I, I was addicted to masturbation from the age of 14 from, I would say the first time from the first time that I masturbated. And so I knew because of doing it so much that it was making me tired and it was stealing my energy. And because I saw this way in which it could be expressed in a loving context that did not require the man to lose all that power. I said, wow, this is, this is new. This is something really different. Never heard about that before. And also the fact that the man was willing to travel halfway across the world for that. I was really moved and his story was so compelling because it was really his authentic journey. That is, it belonged to him. And the way he was before, the way he was after, he learned about all kinds of aspects of his body. Not only as he learned about fasting, he learned about, about being in nature and the connection that every one of our bodies has to the natural world and how his consciousness and his were not separate but they were really a continuum and so i would say that it tapped into what i knew to be true already and so that began a quest of mine a personal quest which was it was more than just semen retention it was about i saw from the beginning it was semen retention, of course, but it was an access to the transformation of consciousness. And that's what I'm really about from the time I was very, very, very small. The number one concern of my life was my relationship with God. And I knew even as a toddler, I just knew that there were blocks between me and God. That is to say that my relationship with God was somehow not right. And so any way to clean that up, to transform that, and also any way in which to express my relationship with the divine, I just always knew that's what I came here for. So I guess you could say I was born a philosopher. I was born religious. I was born into a spirituality that was just in here. Nobody had to put it there. That's just what was there. And so when I picked up this book on the shelf in the bookstore. I, I think I might have read it cover to cover just standing there. It's a pretty thick book, actually. But 
I it blew me away. It just it blew, it blew my mind. I said, okay, this is I gotta this one. I gotta I have to master this one. I have to go after. I have to go all the way with this. I have whatever this is. I got I gotta know about it. I gotta. So that was that was the beginning of a, a certain kind of journey for me. What was the name of the book? If you remember, I I can't I can't for the life of me remember. Some other people that are more devoted to the tantric expression exclusively, they would know it off the top of their head just by hearing the description. But okay. for me, it was just a story, and then that story became, if you will, a part of my story. So that was my experience. Yeah. So God bless the man whoever he was, and also right. Writers, this taught me about that if you can tell your story in writing, you can touch probably even millions of people who might never meet you, might never even know you on a first name basis, but they can know your journey. And so it taught me the importance of that, of going deep spiritually and then being willing to share that because he served me by by so doing himself. Mm hmm. And uh, I see in your, your YouTube about section as well as um, there's something that you talk about a lot in your videos. Uh, this is something from Gurdjieff where he says enlightenment may be in attained by one, retaining one semen, two, engaging in the appropriate conscious labors, and three, like intentional suffering. And so can you go yep. over like each point right there and like what that means, like to retain your semen, to engage in appropriate conscious labors, and then to intentionally suffer? Yeah, for sure, man. Absolutely. So number one, the semen retention, that's in the domain of the body, obviously. And there are basically two ways to approach semen retention. And in Tantra, this is like the two tantric paths, but every religion has this. If it's old enough, it will have this understanding. So there are people that practice celibacy full time whether they have religious vows, like, you know, Buddhist monks, Orthodox monks, whatever kind of, monk, those are people with vows of celibacy generally. But there are also married people. There are people in monogamous relationships wherein they utilize the lovemaking as a container for the flow of love primarily. I'm doing a figure eight pattern here because that's what happens with the energy flow in such a couple. And what that means is not that they can make a baby if they want to, but in lovemaking consciously, the only reason for the man to ejaculate would be for procreation. So that means lovemaking has a primary function. And this is very orthodox, despite what some may tell you. The primary function of, of lovemaking is that. It is lovemaking. In other words, it's a container for the exchange of love. Now, if you want a baby, it's very clear what to do. That is what ejaculation is for. It's for making children. And interestingly, now I'm going to quote Elon Musk on this because he's talked about this in public. He has a bunch of kids. I think he has five kids or nine kids. He has a lot of kids, a few baby mamas, but a bunch of kids. And he said very simply, ejaculation takes an enormous amount of energy. And so what he said is, if I'm not making a baby, not making a child, then losing that much energy, it just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't, frankly. And so that's what I've learned experientially, that when the semen is retained, either in a monogamous context or in a practice frame, if you will, with a lover, where the idea is we're here to love, and to share and to connect, the seed can be retained. That takes some practice and training for men. Women usually are hip to it instantly, more or less, depending. But then the other, of course, is to simply remain celibate entirely in all ways. So that's the semen retention piece, simply to keep the seed within the body. Conscious labor. And feel free to jump in with any questions if they show up or, for you. So, so how does physically... Does just retaining your seed like cause some kind of enlightenment or body change? Like what is um okay, great great question. What part of the enlightenment aspect is the physical aspect doing to you? 
it most definitely changes the body most definitely increases in physical strength improvement in mood on and on and on it changes the biochemistry profoundly in fact so it's almost like the man who retains his seed and i would invite any man watching 30 days of semen retention is a different man it just is if you can go 60 or 90 or 100 days then it's a different experience of every aspect of life particularly the material it's usually obvious at the material level first of all the way that other people show up the way that events show up the way that everything feels so the physical sensation in the body is heightened but calmness and relaxation becomes normal just day to day it just becomes the ease of one's being with one's own body and the need for physical support like from food or sleep or whatever is not nearly as confronting as it is when a man's ejaculating frequently so that's the the physical changes and that makes a pretty good segue if you want into point two the conscious labor part yeah yeah let's go into that so this is the the no if you will the noetic domain the order of spiritual progress by the way spiritual growth always goes in this order body first the noose or the mind the spirit realm of the spirit and then the heart the heart is the final destination so in the conscious labor what gurdjieff is getting at is i see it and I've, I've immersed myself in some of his writings perhaps not as much as others but the the fourth way is what they call his, his body of work generally is that what you put your attention on intentionally so as to work for example let's say a man decided to choose a career path like computer science so now his consciousness is focused on, on a particularity maybe instead you could say studying sanskrit or becoming a salsa dancer or any, anything which requires or martial arts or any labor any worthy labor to which consciousness can be devoted so think of a composer or a poet or a gardener or any any labor that requires attention and of course any labor to do it well even if it's just sweeping the floor in your kitchen or whatever it may be a consciously it could be working with others it could be being a therapist or a coach or a, anything at all a doctor this re requires a focus of attention that's sustained in order for the work itself to be meaningful and the other sense of conscious labor is that it is work done with attention for example remember i said about sweeping the floor of the kitchen well i could sweep the floor of the kitchen probably in my sleep because it doesn't really require an enormous amount of brain power but by the same token i could choose to be fully present and conscious with every single stroke of the brush against the tile floor i could be absolutely attentive to the feeling of my hands on the wooden handle of the broomstick now i could also bring that consciousness to whatever work it may be whether it's something that requires a lot of say intelligence like we said computer science or studying sanskrit or something like this or something quite physical for example lifting weights you may have heard arnold schwarzenegger famously talk about the mind muscle connection well, that's a man who gave a huge part of his life to bodybuilding but he was obviously very successful as a bodybuilder and if you really listen to arnold talk about his philosophy of weightlifting you'll get for him that was a conscious labor that consciousness he devoted himself his attention was absolutely devoted to the labor so Gertrude is talking about the quality with which you labor and that is the, it's deliberate it's intentional and then you can say if you want to have an even broader frame whatever I'm doing that's my conscious labor because I'm choosing so I'll give you an example from this afternoon I was at one of the shops in my neighborhood and I left something I thought in one of the stores so I had to retrace my steps I had to go back over the steps I had 
previously walked an hour earlier or so, but with greater consciousness because I was looking for something. Now, it turns out I actually had dropped it on the pavement only about mm, 25 yards from the door of my home. But because I was retracing my steps, looking for something, look now to take a broader frame than looking for something, I was looking all of a sudden. So to labor with really looking, like right now, I'm I'm just being here with you. For me, if you will, the world at the moment, it's being with you. And sure, I know that there may be things I do afterwards, and there may be things I did beforehand. But the reality is we're sharing here right now. There's a shared experience. You invited me. Please join me here. And so I say, yeah, yeah, for this, however long we're with each other, my consciousness is here. It's right here. And that's also the way that I work with a client. So I have a voice student or I have somebody who's coming with her, a problem in her marriage or a man is coming to me because he has trouble in his financial life or he doesn't really know how to connect with his girlfriend even though they've been together for a while it's something he can't quite reach his heart and her heart so i have to be absolutely there with that person to the best of my ability this is conscious labor i hope that makes a little sense what is conscious labor that's that's that yeah that makes sense and so that's that's all in the realm of the mind right that's like um actually it's before we go to like the realm of the heart yeah, yeah. I, I, you talked a little bit about like the Gurdjieff thing, like, and I also remember yes. reading your blog. Yes. This, this is a little bit off t off track, but um, you said when Go you first it. went to like one of those groups that uh, the person that was talking, you felt like a very deep sense of peace from them. I mean, I'm curious as to like maybe what have you did you learn from that event or like? I will did, uh... tell you. I will tell you. That's a really interesting story. Thank you for asking. Okay, so. This has me go back to a point in my story. So I'll try to include what story I was in for myself at that moment, because the story that I was in consciously before I went into that room had me take something away from that room that I would not have taken from it otherwise. And it is definitely in the frame of conscious labor. So when I was about 19, I just discovered existentially, that is in my experience, that the church that I had grown up in, which was a non-denominational Protestant evangelical church back in California, something was missing for me. I didn't know exactly what was missing. What I did know is what was missing was such a massive missing that I couldn't keep going to church there. But I also didn't know where else I could go. And so I began to explore every religion philosophy art form healing modality and and etc 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 that i possibly could because i was searching for the truth so gurdjieff's work they have generally called it the fourth way i don't know that he ever called it that but his students and their students and the group around that sort of informally around the world which still exists is generally called the fourth way so somehow i i guess i I found a fourth way teacher. This was probably the late 1990s, I think. Yeah, it was probably the late 90s. And finding things online was not so much a thing. So I'm pretty sure I did not find it online. I probably saw a flyer somewhere for a fourth way meeting. And I'll tell the story. So it was at a beautiful home. I think it was in Woodside or Portola Valley. Those are very, very wealthy neighborhoods, a little bit north of San Francisco, a little bit north of Silicon Valley, a little south of San Francisco. I grew up in the South Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. So beautiful, beautiful mansion. But that wasn't the point. I went into this room. I was early, which seemed to be appropriate. And it was full of nice chairs. And then there was a big empty armchair at the front of the room facing us. And everybody in the room was very, 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 very quiet, not saying anything at all. And I was somehow at ease in my body with them. Now, what they were practicing consciously was a practice Gurdjieff called self-observation. And he borrows that from the Holy Fathers of Orthodoxy. He was born into Orthodox Christianity. And the early Holy Fathers, especially the early monastic Holy Fathers, the most common piece of advice that they would give their spiritual sons was, my son, be attentive to thyself. And so Gurdjieff taught that as a way of life. 
observe your body, observe your feelings, observe your thoughts. You could even say that in Far Eastern tra traditions that are often called meditation, even though that's one word for you know 11,000 different actual practices, you could say that the ground of spiritual practice is effectively paying attention to yourself. So it was a room full of people just paying attention to themselves and they were not talking. Now, I'll be honest, that was very challenging for me at that time in my life. I was 19. Although I had a lot of immersion in a Protestant form of spirituality, which was an enormous amount of Bible reading and Bible study in a very sort of scholarly academic type way, my primary experience of spirituality had been effectively people talking about God. And these people were here just being in silence and they really weren't doing anything. I mean, they, they didn't use any particular meditative posture. They weren't doing a particular breathing exercise. No, but this was a room full of people. And you wouldn't even have said they're in meditation. This is just a room full of people who were just absolutely quiet. And I mean, like you could hear a pin drop quiet. They didn't even shuffle their feet. It was just, but they clearly were experienced with that because nobody was uncomfortable even. And this was confronting for me because of the sheer depth of their practice. They were very experienced in self-observation. When people become like that, they're just way more at peace all the time. To use a little colloquial thing, because they know what's up with them. And if you kind of know what's happening with you, you more or less have a baseline from which to experience all of life. Now, a lot of folks walk through the world upset. And they don't know what that's about, maybe, or they kind of do, but maybe not. Or they might even be upset and they don't know they are. And they're just running that upset game. And then their lives look like various ways to compensate for their upsets. But when people practice self-observation, the way, that, this is my experience anyway, the way God made our consciousness is that it is profoundly healing. So to give your attention to yourself, or to another is actually where all well-being and healing or prayer or authentic spiritual practice or authentic creativity or authentic love making or authentic business or what have you it begins from that if it's going to work even prayer without attention to oneself consciously one of the the saints of the 20th century said about prayer specifically prayer without attention is work without pay so these people were practicing something that I was not acquainted with, but man, that room was quiet. It was quiet in a way. The lights were a bit dim too, so as to help people just be calm and not really focused on any worldly thing. It was a very nice, comfortable home, but not. it wasn't even like, let's show off our fancy stuff. It was really nice, but there was nothing overdone, except it was really clear it was probably a multi-million dollar home in a very expensive neighborhood, but they weren't even trying to show off decor. It was just... There was nothing that you could focus on that would take your attention outside of yourself is the way it was set up. And then after we had been sitting, I want to say maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, this gentleman, he had a big beard. I would say he was probably about 50, 55, a bit of a pot belly. He just strolled in gently but solidly. He was a solid, solid character, very grounded and deeply silent. There was a... Now, the silence that he walked into the room with was a depth and a degree of silence that I knew, okay, this is something of what was missing for me in that church I grew up in. And I don't remember almost anything that he said. I can remember the sound of his voice a little bit, but I don't really remember anything that he said at all. It wasn't the point. The point was... What I saw him demonstrate, including the way he walked into the room, the way he sat there so calmly, the way he wasn't looking for anybody's approval. I couldn't detect a single insecurity in him. He was present both with himself and everyone else who was present. In a way that I had simply never witnessed prior to that moment. Now. That was the one and only time, and I actually mean in my whole life, that I ever sat in a room with an actual fourth-way master. So I believe 
he's a disciple of a disciple of a disciple of Gurdjieff. So I think it was like this, Gurdjieff, Uspensky, somebody else, and then this gentleman. So this is a, let's say, inside of 75 year connection to when Gurdjieff was actually alive. Whatever this man was demonstrating in his way of being, it moved me profoundly and I said, okay, in my what was missing, that's some of what was missing. Also, I made a mental note. I can't do it right now. I just, I was really, I've always tried to be honest as a person about my level of development. And I'm, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher vocationally. So I can't pretend to have knowledge I don't have either as a teacher or as a student, because that inauthenticity means we're not really learning. Now we're just pretending to be something we ain't, and that doesn't work. But I had an been in a place where there was that much depth in one room before and it was too confronting as i can't i can't i can't i can't keep i can't keep going to this room it's too much for me but i made a mental note put a pin in it i am going to go after the the fourth way work fully at some of some point in my life it took me i think like 23 years after that that i started actually intensively studying gurdjieff and between that moment and Roughly two decades later, I learned a whole bunch of things that it turns out let me finally understand Gurdjieff. And I think that I can read Gurdjieff right now with more understanding of what he's actually talking about, especially at a granular level, including the jokes and things. I don't think there's a lot of other folks right now on the earth that have access to Gurdjieff the way I do for a, a whole bunch of different reasons, even though I, I wouldn't claim to be awake like some of the those fourth way masters are. But now Gurdjieff can speak to me in a way that's really direct, like we're having a chat with a really goofy, but also ingenious, awake friend. So that's kind of how I experience Gurdjieff now. Kind of a long answer to your question there, but there it was. No, I love it. So uh, when it comes to uh, engaging in conscious labor, it's just it's a combination of self-observation while you're working. Is that what kind of you would say that the definition that is a good it's a good beginning it's a good beginning because without the self-observation conscious labor is not possible because consciousness it's really unbounded if we're honest in other words i suppose your mother is not present with you right now yeah she's not in the room in other no. words yes yeah, no, no. but if i said can you see a picture of your mother's face can you see a picture yeah, of your mother's yeah. face? So that's how consciousness behaves. Now, if God forbid your mother had died yesterday, you would still be able to do that because consciousness is like that. So because consciousness is unbounded, if I'm saying the frame is conscious labor, I have to be conscious of me and the labor without there being a boundary. I'll give you an example so that people can have a grounded example of this. And I would invite your listeners to go onto YouTube sometime after and do a search for this. So there's a pianist, many people consider him the greatest concert pianist that ever recorded, or maybe, maybe even ever lived, depending on who you ask. Vladimir Horowitz, Vladimir Horowitz. There's a million videos of him on YouTube playing the piano. If you watch him playing the piano when there's a, a long shot where you see both him and the piano, and I really invite people to watch this because you can actually see it you can see it if you what it looks like is and what it feels like is there are no boundaries between the man and the piano and he's so conscious of himself and so in a meditative state himself he's totally conscious of himself it's as though he's watching somebody else play his hands on his piano and it, it occurs as life, the man and the piano, and the music and the notes and all of it and the phrasing and everything, it becomes, it is one experience. Clearly you can see there's a piano and there's a man and then there's music, so it's a tripartite. By the way, life for us, man, it just, it breaks down threefold. So piano, man, music. Which by the way, correlates to the Holy Trinity. Man would be Jesus Christ, piano, father in a sense and then holy ghost or you could reverse it you could say 
the man would be the father because he actually invented the piano. And then the voice is like the logos, Jesus Christ. And then the music, which you can't see, but you can certainly experience it. That's the Holy Ghost. So something like that. But what you'll notice is the music, the man, and the piano, they are one. And yet they're also three. But they really feel like one. One harmonious expression. That's what conscious labor looks like. When you watch a master, but by the same token, if you go to a really, really competent martial arts instructor, like a masterful teacher who's a high-level martial artist but is a really gifted teacher, what they figured out in the martial arts over thousands of years is how to bring consciousness not only to the high-level masterful degree, but even in the learning process, which is the reason people get so much out of martial arts. Never mind that you know they haven't gotten the black belt yet, which may take 10 or 15 or 20 years depending upon the art form even on day one most students in a really competent martial arts environment on day one they walk out and they know that they got something and it they were practicing fighting techniques if it's martial arts but almost everybody without exception that i've ever spoken to knows he walked out of there with an experience of himself and life and even other people that wasn't so much about fighting well that's because competently done any training process breaks down conscious labor even at the learning level. So you don't have to wait till you're a master to go for conscious labor. You can just do something like wash your dishes and just really be attentive with the feeling of your fingers on the ceramic of the plate, the way that the soap suds smell or the clink of a piece of silverware against another piece of just listening to that. So consciousness can be intentionally brought to any labor and what Gurdjieff is really saying is this has to become your way of life if semen retention is going to offer you the benefits that it can and he's very clear that semen retention without conscious labor and intentional suffering doesn't lead to perfection in other words semen retention is a beginning point it does not create an endpoint automatically it just it just doesn't mm -hmm. and then intentional suffering what exactly is that and is there like a certain amount is there a certain level of suffering that you need in order for i mean i feel like you might overload on some suffering or maybe it's too little so you don't grow so like what's what exactly is intentional suffering and what's the right level of suffering nicely outlined it's very seldom the same for any two people maybe never the same for any two people in other words, this is where one must discover the meaning of the, well, in all, all things, there's an ancient Greek proverb, pan metron ariston. Pan means all. Metron means measure. Ariston means something like is the best. A version of ariston is where we get the word aristocratic, like the aristocrats are theoretically the best people. So pan metron ariston literally means everything according to the measure which is best or everything according to the measure is how you get to the best in other words this has to be measured so let's say think of a basketball player shaquille o'neal he's an enormous man he's absolutely enormous he's a huge huge person and he's also a super athlete on top of that now think of a woman who's a petite little hundred pounds or for my europeans less than 50 kilo woman who's you know, five feet tall. They both need to eat. They're not going to eat the same amount of food, right? They're just not going to. There's a right amount of food for Shaq. There's a right amount of food for the, you know, five foot, hundred pound lady. So that's an example of the measure with respect to eating. But the same thing is true of suffering. So this has two aspects. There's suffering which comes our way by virtue of that we live here on the earth. This is, nobody gets out of this one, no exceptions ever when that shows up you say yes to it so let's say someone cheats you out of seventy thousand dollars and now you're down to you know seventy thousand less than you had you say yes to that now the suffering which was involuntary because you didn't ask for the dude to cheat you out of 70k now it's you've transmuted it into intentional suffering but you said yes to it you just i choose it then there's intentional suffering which is more literally what Gurdjieff was focusing on, which is this. You take on things. One of his favorite things was cold exposure. So he and his students would go in ice baths 
or bathe naked in freezing cold rivers. Wim Hof is a famous cold practitioner in our time. Mm -hmm. That would be a form of intentional suffering. That's a form. Fasting, which is to voluntarily deprive oneself of food and water or certain kinds of food or all food, but still whatever. Depriving oneself of something in the domain of food, that's another intentional suffering. And one of the most important and powerful ones is giving away money or giving away resources, which is to say I have X amount of money, but I choose to give away whatever percentage up to and including all of it for some of the saints, which is a suffering. Like to walk around in the world with absolutely no money, just try that out. See how easy that is. It ain't that easy. And to have less money than you do always is in your mind. Your mind is going, that's not, that, that's not that easy. That's gonna... So that's another kind of intentional suffering. There are many ways to do it, though, but those are some classic important ones. Bodily asceticism, which is just like fasting, like cold exposure. There are things like doing prostrations. There are vigils, standing up all night, depriving oneself of sleep for a spiritual practice. There are lots and lots of different flavors of intentional suffering. And most ancient spiritual practices very often are some version of this. Okay, so my next question then would be, how do you experience healing on semen retention? Or, or does it have healing properties to practice this? Yes, it does. So the favorite part of this for me is that it occurs spontaneously. Things just improve in the domain. So you don't have to put your body. mind into it or anything, right? You don't have to like try to consciously be like, I'm going to heal. It just automatically kind of just happen. You certainly can direct your attention to healing or anything else you like but in the frame of healing semen retention begins to potentiate in a, ma in a man's body his well-being and so the energy which is not being ejaculated out of his goes to healing whatever needs to be healed on the physical level first and then spiritually slash emotionally as well so it is going to facilitate healing but then by the same token the man can consciously direct his attention to something in himself or his life that needs to be healed and it's way more efficient that way by orders of magnitude it's just it's really orders of magnitude by the way one of the benefits of a marital or monogamous or a lovemaking semen retention frame is that the feminine energy then flows through the man's body blends with his masculine energy and when he's retaining his seed, it speeds up the healing process significantly. <laughs> really, really something, actually. So the, the healing is, is what your body's up to anyway. That's Your body has instincts that God put in there to be well, to care for itself. So it's always moving in the direction of healing before you wish for it to do that. And it's like... You're no longer wasting energy, which is fuel for all of your life, both your body and your soul. And so when the body needs healing, it's just going to heal way more efficiently if a man's retaining his seat. No question about that. And what physically does it heal? Depends upon what needs to be healed. Maybe there's tissue repair. Okay. Maybe it's something as simple as muscle soreness after a workout. You name it across the board. In my experience, men's bodies heal much more quickly and efficiently when they're retaining their seed. It used to be a standard part of traditional Chinese medicine. If a man was ever really ill, and we're talking about including men that have no interest in semen retention generally, it would be very traditional for the Chinese doctor to say, you need to go 100 days without an ejaculation because you're in a situation, even if it was a younger man who could ordinarily ejaculate more frequently without causing himself harm. If there was a serious diagnosis or serious injury, a traditional Chinese medical doctor of old would have said, "You, I need you to do 100 days. Even if you're married, sorry, you're going to have to do because we need that energy because what we need to heal in your case is that big a deal but by the same token even if there's nothing major nothing dramatic or catastrophic it's still profoundly healing 
and it contributes to well-being in ways that just got to experience it to believe me speaking to anybody who's not tried this and to those of you who are trying for semen retention maybe having some challenges around it because that's normal that's going to show up especially today heaven help us because the world is now designed to turn men into ejaculation machines it didn't used to be like that even 100 years back it wasn't really like that so much so if you're trying to practice semen retention i promise you whomever's listening here it's more worthwhile than you can imagine and if you do what it takes to master this practice or to even improve this practice which means to say go more days to be able to do that for a longer period it's worthwhile to an extent that it's actually very difficult to put it into words it's that profound and touching yeah and i have a verse here it's a first corinthians 6 9 um it goes like this know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind uh, i think well, i don't know the rest of it i think yeah. we'll inherit the kingdom i think it goes like that but um do you think that verse re represents because i know the bible doesn't talk about masturbation and stuff but do you think this kind of hints at it when it talks about oh, being effeminate you know, or... there's no question that that verse is a direct reference to the physiological manifestation of the kingdom of heaven, because we know Christ said in the gospels, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Yes, he's talking about your body. He's absolutely talking about your body. It's not just talking about some metaphoric idea that the kingdom of God is within you. He's talking about your body literally. God is not going to live in an unfit house. He just isn't. The Holy Ghost is not going to fill an unfit vessel. It's just what's required. So what that verse is talking about is the necessity of what's sometimes called continence, which is to say having the properly under control and properly focused, where the kingdom of heaven, it's not going to dwell consciously. It's not going to. So this is absolute necessity in order for the spirituality for which we were really created to manifest because our bodies have to be a fit vehicle for that there's no question about it and so this is where the spiritual healing begins like what is what does spiritual healing look like then so that's of course again different for different folks depending upon what their challenges are you can what would be a unique challenge so okay so there are actually nine basic challenges. And so you might have heard, have you heard, you, would you do me a favor? Would you read out yes. loud Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23? And right read it a James. little bit slow. That's beautiful. That's what I would read to Read it a little slowly, kind of nail each word. There's a reason we're doing this here. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy peace mm -hmm. long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law great okay so now Let's do this a second time, but just the fruit of the Spirit. So start with love, and we're going to count. Go ahead. So I do the same kind of slow, right? Good, good. Just starting at love. Start at love. Love. It's one. Joy. Two. Peace. That's three. Long suffering. Gentleness. Four. Five. Goodness. Six. Eight. Seven meekness, eight temperance. And that's against nine. You can stop there. Such so those you can you can stop there. That's cool. So those nine virtues are the definition of life as God meant it to be, or as the fathers like to say, life according to nature. 
Each of those nine has an opposite. The nine opposites of those nine virtues are the nine chief temptations. Everyone in this lifetime will have one of those nine chief temptations, which I'll go over in a second, and a secondary one, which will remain stable over one's lifetime. And then one might possibly get pulled into a temptation, which is one of those nine opposites of the nine virtues, that is not going to be that way for a lifetime, but is a, a phase. So I'll give you an example. Number one, love. The opposite of love is cowardice or the fear of dying. Now, generally speaking, if I sit with the person enough to perceive him, I can notice what of those nine vices, which are the opposite of the nine virtues, which St. Paul just gave us there, is the chief temptation for his lifetime, and then the secondary one. And so if one's really going to grow spiritually and is really devoted to spiritual growth, he needs to know what's his chief temptation this lifetime, what's his secondary temptation for this lifetime, and any one of the nine vices that he might be hung up on. So we'll do this real quick, and people can reference it. The opposite okay. of love, cowardice, is the fear of death. The opposite of joy is the passion of sorrow. Peace, the opposite of peace, is despondency. Today, that's often called depression. Sometimes it's called bipolar. Sometimes it's called anxiety. That's the opposite of peace. So love, joy, peace, patience, or long-suffering. The opposite of that is anger. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, or gentleness. The opposite of the virtue of gentleness or kindness, or loving kindness, is the passion of fornication, which means all kinds of misconduct, whatever the kind. It could be masturbation or cheating on your wife or any any number or whatever but there's a lot of in, inappropriate conduct that's the opposite so the, the passion of fornication is the opposite of the virtue of gentleness so love joy peace patience gentleness and what's after that one it's the number six it's gonna be uh goodness 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 that's right so the opposite of the virtue of goodness is the passion of vain glory which is the constant need for the praise and approval of others, right? Then after that, we have number seven is greed or avarice. That's, if I yeah, faith. The right. That's correct. The opposite of greed is faith. All money worries, by the way, whether it's I want more, I want more, I want more, which is usually what money worries look like, even if you have nothing or if you're in debt or if you're a billionaire and you want more billions, it's still I want more is the money story. The opposite of that is the virtue of faith. Then meekness, which is another way of saying humility, the opposite of that is pride. And the last one, temperance or self-control in other translations, the opposite of that is gluttony, which means eating or drinking to excess. So those are the nine chief temptations which correlate to the nine virtues. By the way, there are nine ranks of angels in heaven and there are nine ranks of demons that are constantly fighting with those nine ranks of angels. And guess where that fight happens? It happens inside of you and inside of me. And that battle on a daily basis is what spiritual life is about. That's why we often call it a war, spiritual warfare. That's the nature of spiritual warfare. So spiritual healing means... Whatever vice is manifesting, either chronically over the course of one's lifetime or temporarily, like, for example, somebody might have his chief temptation as the temptation of pride, which means the virtue that he needs in order to transform that is chiefly the virtue of humility. But what if that man becomes an alcoholic? That's actually the passion of gluttony, which is eating or drinking to excess. So he's going to have to develop self-control whether it's through Alcoholics Anonymous or what have you, whatever he needs. Because if that one is dominating his life, he's never going to go in and solve his chief temptation, which is pride. So for spiritual healing, it requires, this is actually what Gurdjieff hopes we'll find as we're attentive to ourselves. We'll also find our negative tendencies. We'll find what we can continually tend to do that we ought not to do, or what we continually ought to do that we continually don't do. The contrast. And so that's where spiritual healing comes in. This is a huge part of my work, especially coaching with men. 
this is also something I've devoted more than 20 years of study to, which is the actual understanding of psychology, which is proper to Orthodox Christianity and exists in other religions as well. In fact, the verse nine verses of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu are about precisely these nine conflicts. So this is not something that's unique to Christianity. This is something that is unique to the experience of being a person in the world, because there is no person in the world that the demons are going to leave alone. No one. No one gets out of the spiritual war. doesn't matter what religion you are or if you say you're an atheist. And because God is gracious, there is no person that the angels aren't going to come help if that person asks. Which means the cultivation of virtue and the elimination of vice, it's what you need to be successful in your life. It's also what you need in order to be spiritually transformed. They're actually not separate. They're a continuum. Awesome. And uh, we're running out of time here, but um, where can people find you? And yeah, link anything. Okay, you man. Want. So, yeah, you bet. You can go to my YouTube channel, which is Semen Retention Journey, in order to get some insight. And I will be creating more videos there about how semen retention can function in the ecosystem of being a male. And if you happen to be a woman watching this, you may develop understanding of men. You might also, just a little plug for any female viewers, if there are some, you might also develop an understanding of the kind of man who's worth being with. And you'll be able to, if you are a woman listening, you can support men by learning about masculinity from this spiritual frame. And then you can go to my Substack blog, just do a Google search, Substack stack semen retention is the first thing that comes up and those are two good places and via either you can contact me there is also links to a telegram channel that i run which is for men who are interested in semen retention and that forms like a sort of a community place where people can chat about whatever's going on and you can reach out to me every time somebody subscribes to the substack blog it lets me know if you're really interested in something particular, you might even comment on the Substack blog and say, hey, this is really interesting. I want coaching around this, and then I'll see that and contact you. So men are welcome to get coaching if they want around this, or women, if they want the spiritual transformation aspect here. There is continence for women as well. It's just that it's often more difficult for men. So the reason we address it so much. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can find me online. And of course, feel free to reach out to Ezekiel. If you have any questions that you want me to address on a second recording with you and your yeah, listeners course. ask you, hey, I want to ask him about this, or I want a coaching session, what does that cost? They can also get to you and then we can, you know, put them in touch with me as need be. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you for coming on and um, My pleasure see you for part two. Me. Looking forward to it. You betcha. <laughs>